from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for November 18th, 2022. Check in the calendar. The Bucks are home for a couple of games this week. On Monday, the Trailblazers are in town, and Wednesday, it's the Bulls. The Packers have a few days off before traveling to Philly to play the Eagles Thanksgiving weekend. The National Park Service issued an unusual warning. Please stop licking psychedelic toads. <laughs> no, really. These Sonoran Desert toads are very poisonous, so besides getting you high, they could also kill you. <laughs> Their eyes glow bright green at <coughs> night, so you know they're high. <laughs> but it makes you wonder who's the first person to think, let's lick that thing. <laughs> the Perth Museum in Perth, Australia, had a contest to rename its museum. And the envelope, please. The winner is the Perth Museum. <laughs> Whatever happened to Bodie McBoatface? <laughs> this is kind of a math problem. A 43-year-old man discovered his girlfriend has five husbands and another boyfriend on the side. And he's okay with that as long as she remains faithful to him. Someone should buy this guy a dictionary so he can look up faithful. <laughs> Gregory Foster, a California man with a passion for hot peppers, earned his latest Guinness World Records title by eating 10 of the hottest peppers in the world, Carolina Reaper chilies. He ate those 10 in 33 seconds. I'm oh. guessing he doesn't have a lot of close friends oh. or, or even friends that want to stand close to him. <laughs> On the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Mike Helsel, Joel Dreesang, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, not uh, too spicy of a week for the markets, at least. The NASDAQ down 1.6%, closing at 11,146. The S&P down 0.7 for the week, closing at 39.66. And the Dow essentially flat for the week, closing at 33.748, right where it began. For the year, the NASDAQ down 28.3%, the S&P down 15.8%. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 5.7%. On the week, the benchmark 10-year U.S. Treasury yield moved just a, a tick higher, closing the week at 3.82 after starting at 3.81. So, uh, you know, maybe some signs that while we didn't get a positive week this week, we didn't give back all the gains we've got in the last month and a half, Art. Um, and yet, despite a largely uh, – quiet week for economics, a largely quiet week for the markets. You know, there's still some big losses on the books even after the last six weeks. I think I'm encouraged by the fact that we didn't turn around and give it all back, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't been a tough year so far. Yeah, definitely a tough year so far. But the week, especially when you had marauding uh, Fed governors going around the country talking about more pain that they're going to inflict and how we shouldn't expect interest rates to uh, decline anytime soon. As a matter of fact, they're going to go higher. So the fact that stocks ended flat to slightly lower, the fact that uh, interest rates stayed relatively the same as they were, you know, a week ago, um, with no significant news as you suggested to impact investors, I think it's pretty good that investors stayed the course. And w- was today triple witching day or one of those days as well, which you can expect. Yes. Yeah. So all things considered, I think we escaped, you know pretty well. Yeah, Triple Witching Day, of course, a pretty nuanced uh, and out there concept for investors that aren't used to looking at kind of the intraday moves of markets. Uh, A reminder, of course, that there's all kinds of complex market derivatives that have set maturities. There are certain points in time in which all of them kind of converge upon themselves. And Triple Witching is this kind of idea that all of these different contracts for all of these different types of things all kind of merge at this one point that can wreak havoc sometimes, cause certainly heightened volatility. And despite all that, uh, you know, despite those convergences, pretty encouraged by the fact that things didn't just fall apart the way they could. As we said, you know, the Dow finishing almost entirely where it started, just about unheard of. Uh, You get enough measurement points, you're going to find some of those, right? It's the law of large numbers. Um, But, you know, I think important to point out, Joel, as we look at some of the economic stuff, it's more or less more of the same, right? Some signs that inflation starting to continue to come down, uh, if that's not stringing too many uh, 
too many hedges into that same same conversation. No, it's there. always it's always uh, it's always good to put qualifications in in what you're saying. So um, yeah, I mean you know we're seeing uh, continued moderation of of inflation, which is one of the things that we want to be seeing. It's the thing that we most want to be seeing from what the Fed's been doing with the interest rates. Um, so uh, we began the week with the producer price index, which is looking at inflation on the wholesale level. Um, if you compare it with a year ago, that rate was um, the lowest it's been in 15 months. If you take the the, the more volatile aspects of uh, food and, and energy out of there, then it was the lowest it's been in 17 months. So that's a good sign. It's still high. It's still, you know, two or three, it's three times more than what the Fed wants as, as far as the inflation rate, but it's still up there. We had um, signs in the uh, capacity utilization um, from, from the Fed uh, that came out on Wednesday that um, there might be some easing in, in that, which is also a sign of easing of inflation. So that's a good sign. Um, and then later in the week, um, today and, and yesterday, we had numbers uh, on various housing indicators, and those were showing that, I mean, that that's the, the one area of the economy that's most going to be affected by these higher interest rates, higher mortgage rates. Um, demand for housing is going down. So, you know, we had a word from the National Association of Realtors that uh, October saw the ninth month in a row of, of uh, closing uh, home prices, I mean, and ho home sales. Um, on the other side of that, the home prices continue to be up. On the other side of that, um, you know, the, the moderating inflation, we still have consumer spending. We still, we had retail numbers this week that showed that there's still, um, you know, demand out there from consumers and they're still out there shopping. Uh, and, and to mitigate that a little bit, we had another report from the New York, uh, the, the, the Federal Bank of New York um, came out with a, a look at household debt. And they found that credit card debt actually year to year um, has been up in the last year, uh, the highest it's been in, in 20 years. So there's some signs that um, consumers, that the demand is there, but that the, you combine it with the inflation, the higher prices, people are using their credit card more, they're running out of money uh, of their own, um, but they still have that demand out there. So it's going to be interesting to see how long that lasts. Well, and I think important to point out that household balance sheets entering this period of higher revolving debt spend, right, of higher credit card spend, were fairly strong. And so you'd be concerned if credit card spend was high and it started to run higher. You'd be concerned because it tends to signal that people's ability to spend is going to taper at some point because you can only lever up, you can only spend so much on credit before you run out of the ability to do that. And so, you know, for me, it's the early signs of, you know, the exact things you're talking about, that prices are starting to have an impact on people's ability to pay for things, that maybe we've got to spend a, spend a little on revolving loans now, spend a little on credit card, um, just to keep the spending going. It's also a sign, though, that people aren't all that concerned about what their job prospects are, right? You wouldn't be spending money right now. Retail sales wouldn't be taking higher if you were concerned a month or two from now, you might not have a place to work. And so you know, I think it speaks to this fact that, you know, the, the Fed is trying to do everything they can to slow inflation. We're seeing the consequence of that, certainly, uh, in, how, in things like the housing numbers and things like housing pricing. But at the same time, we're seeing that, broadly speaking, people are fairly optimistic that they're going to be able to at least afford the same spending tomorrow that they're doing today. The Fed can raise those interest rates, but it has a very indirect and, and lagging effect on um, people losing their jobs. Um, you know, we still have the demographics of, of uh, the U.S. right now that, that there's a, a, a glut of, um, there's a dearth of, of, uh, of workers out there. And, and so we need to um, you know, keep watching that. And, and that's what's fueling the confidence of people spending. And as long as people are spending, the economy is going to still grow. And, you know, I think we, we look at this inflation number pretty tightly, Mike. There's all kinds of measures. There's all kinds of ways we can look at it. Capital Economics this week had another publication. They've been early on kind of their call for disinflation, this idea that the rate of inflation will start to slow. Not that we're going to go back to the prices we had, not that prices are going to come back down, but that finally the rate is starting to slow. 
um, and we're there. And as you look at all kinds of measures, as you look at all kinds of uh, kind of signals, we're starting to see signs that maybe people are starting to get on board with this idea that inflation is finally going to get there. What are you seeing? So just real quick, in the spirit of Thanksgiving coming up, I will be very thankful when we do not have to have the inflation conversation anymore. That is something I'm very much looking forward to. But when we talk about inflation, obviously the big driver of it is the interest rates, right? But one of the things that can help ease inflationary pressures is the supply chain, right? And I mentioned a few weeks ago, or last time I was on the pod, I don't remember exactly when that was because time is a flat circle at this point, but the cost of shipping containers from China to LA dropping dramatically, right? And now what we're seeing is, this is from the Kansas City Fed, um, that they're seeing supply chain stress is pretty much non-existent. And um, delivery times are some of the lowest on record. So with that, that's going to help kind of inflationary pressures ease a little bit, right? It's not going to be the whole part of the pie or even a big part, but any little piece can help drive inflation down. And so it's interesting about, what was it, we're talking two, three months ago, we didn't even think there was a chance they could cut rates next year. And now you're seeing some people kind of even float that theory. I don't know if I'm fully on board with that yet, but I find it interesting that that's even a possibility being floated out there at this point. Yeah, the idea that we're talking about rate cuts potentially by the end of the year next year and capital economics in their kind of release talked pretty cleanly about this idea that, yeah, the Fed may cause a mild recession. It will be mild because of the labor force and how strong that is right now. But this idea that if if we do hit a mild recession, the Fed's going to have to change direction pretty quick here. And we could be talking about cuts in interest rates next year. Well, okay. Even if they're early, even if the kind of the timing of that call is early, it's the direction we care most about. Um, and I think the other thing that for me has signaled a bit of all clear and art, we talk about this and how unimportant it is long term, but the political landscape seems to be favoring this idea now that perhaps some of the spending that so many people were counting on as inflationary. It's a bit less likely with the, the, the Republicans now taking the House. Yeah, I don't think we need more spending. And so the fact that we likely won't have it is a good thing. That's going to help the Fed. And but the, the fascinating thing to me about what we've been talking about, and Mike, your interest in not talking as much about inflation, wouldn't we all love to not have to talk about it? Um, this is probably going to be the worst year for investors since 2008, um, if it continues this way. But I remember distinctly in 2008 how bad things were. You know, people were losing their homes, banks were going under, uh, the global financial system was really on the ropes. Um, this time around, we've been talking about the Fed raising rates and how it's going to slow something, but consumers are still spending and people still have jobs. And, it, and even in contrast to two years ago when we had the pandemic, when stocks dropped 30 percent, you know, in, in, in one month, and, you know, that quickly changed. So this is a different time, and so we're talking nuances here. You know, the Fed may not, it may not have to lower rates if they are successful in just lowering, uh, raising rates enough, and they're talking about leaving them at a certain level for a longer period of time. And another thing they could do, they could accept a higher level of inflation. 2% is sort of a target. They might say, hey, we're going to settle for 3 for a while and, and let things be. And any, anything they do that suggests they're not going to be as aggressive, which they're not going to be, they're going to raise rates a half a percent in December, any slowdown from there, you, this market, we saw the rally a week ago. We could see this continue. I mean, we could actually be positive into the end of the year, depending on what happens. I doubt it. So, but it's like, the, you know, we're waiting for a disaster to happen that hasn't. You know, there's no disaster here. And inflation, they just want to nip it in the bud before it gets worse. So we had a year, year and a half, two years maybe of higher prices, it plateaus. This could be a pretty incredible time looking forward for investors to be in the game when companies continued to sell a whole bunch of stuff and make a whole bunch of money without having to worry, as Mike suggested, about inflation. And of course, the last period of high inflation that so many investors dealt with, and especially so many of our investors, was a period of prolonged high inflation. Um, and the challenge is we kind of base our assumptions for what this period is going to look like based on the last one we went through. It's probably the exception, not the rule. Based on history, inflation tends to pop and settle down pretty quick. And given the Fed's commitment, given how clearly the Fed has talked about wanting to fight and win this war, 
You know, I think the the reality is that the the 1970s into 80s kind of an inflationary experience is the exception. Doesn't mean inflation, as you say, isn't going to run a little hotter than what the Fed wants for a while, but it may mean that the Fed's willing to accept that if it means not putting the economy into a tailspin. Kyle, okay, when we're talking about inflation in the 8% range and we're saying that it's the highest it's been in 40 years, 40 years ago, that was the downside <laughs> of, of where inflation was at the yeah. time. And, and to your point, I mean, it was in double digits for those of, the, you know, those of us who remember. Yeah, and unfortunately, um, you know, again, I think you're the victim of your latest experience, and that was the latest experience of inflation. And so, so many are going to kind of extrapolate out what it's supposed to look like well, the reality is it's dangerous to say this time's different. They're all different. Um, you know, I think the the other piece that has come out of this, and you pointed it out rightfully, is this is the worst year we've had for the type of investing that we believe so strongly in. Art is, well, okay, is the 60-40 portfolio dead? It's the headline that's been written, I think, far too many times. Um, my kind of take on that on that headline is, maybe this is the start of a new period for the 60-40 portfolio, right? That the last 10 years were a period in time in which the 40, the bond component of your portfolio, that 40%, didn't do what it had been doing for, for the better part of 40 years because interest rates were as low as they were. Well, remember that interest rates are three times higher than they were 10 years ago. And so all of a sudden, you're talking about a period in time in which the math is going to work substantially different going forward than it did looking back. Yeah, and to your credit, the Wall Street Journal followed your lead. You suggested this in our advisors meeting seven, eight weeks ago, that this was the worst time period since, and as the Wall Street Journal pointed out, 1937 for this type of investing. Now, I've been here, I'm in my 31st year here. We've been doing this forever. It works, and it works over long periods of time. So, th so the Wall Street Journal points out, okay, the math isn't working this year, but that's one year out of you know, do the math. I can't even, you know, 80, 90 years. And so we think it's a great way to invest, and we do expect to make money going forward. And yes, it'll be nice if the bond component provides positive returns. There have been decades in the past where bonds did better than stocks. And I don't anticipate that because stocks have been hammered so much. So I'd rather buy stocks for gains. Cash is doing great as well. But I think the mistake investors make is by judging a, a methodology that works by one year in which it's disappointing. And, and that's all we're talking about here. It's a disappointing year. We're not giving up what we do just because somebody has a point out, oh, it's bad. Well, of course it's bad. But if you go back three years and you've been invested in a balanced portfolio over three years, you're making money. You go back five years, you're making even more money. You go back 10 years, you're making even more money. And I'll bet you, although we, I don't think we can legally do this on this podcast, that the next 10 years will do well too. So all I can do is keep my fingers crossed. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And of course, it's all about investing in what you know, right? It's all about investing in kind of the, the ways that we know historically work out. Mike, we got a good example this week of kind of something that seems to have not worked out in a reminder on the, the cryptocurrency thing. Um, <laughs> and, you know, more and more keeps coming out about the collapse of this FTX, this cryptocurrency kind of based company. But I think a reminder for investors is that you want to focus on what you know. Exactly. I mean, I believe I said this before on the podcast, but when people bring up cryptocurrency in meetings and stuff like that, my question to them is, how does it, like, why does the price of a crypto go up or down? And I just get blank looks. <laughs> and I go, well, there you go. If you don't know why it goes up or down, you shouldn't be involved in it. And as you said, this week, the more details that come out about this, it, the more it just shows that, like, you really shouldn't be in this because it is completely unregulated. It's the Wild West. They can do whatever they want. You can, ha I mean, you think you're invested in, like, the latest, greatest thing, but some 30-year-old in the Bahamas is just basically stealing your money. I mean, and I'm not speculating there. That's actually what happened. So it's, it is a good reminder to clients of, listen, this year might have been rough, as Art said, with 60-40, but it's worked for years. Always following the latest and greatest fad isn't guaranteed success to get you anywhere. There are going to be bumps in the road, but if you stick with what you know, in the end, you know, you're going to be the tortoise while the hare is tripping over bitcoins left and right trying to get to the finish line. <laughs> I, uh, I definitely appreciate that, uh, that perspective, Mike. I think uh, a good place to end it here this week, a reminder 
Uh, next week, Thanksgiving, uh, we'll have uh, our annual tradition, our Thanksgiving giving podcast for you. I'd encourage you to tune in. I think some pretty good ideas about uh, even in a year in which we're down as much as we are right now, uh, how you can um, maybe take advantage of some of the opportunities that are out there, how you can ensure that you're enriching uh, those organizations, those individuals around you that, that you want to. And so, uh, you know, as always, thank you for listening. We enjoy doing the program for you, uh, and we look forward to talking to you next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com.